Hey, what's up everybody? It's Leeds, and we're back for some more Thronebreaker, and last time we defeated a Draconid convincingly, but we also ran into what might be one of the most difficult puzzles that we have had thus far. It not only was very unintuitive, it had at least one instance where it seemed as though the descriptions on the cards is not what we actually saw happen in-game, which is a little frustrating because it felt like we were deceived a bit there, but I think I may have devise a strategy for taking this on. So, let's hop in here. Before I forget what it is I think might be the solution for taking out this beast here, let's start the battle. That is the objective, taking out this guy. And the deal is that he will spawn in Barges on every turn. And so, he has immunity until all these Barges go away, which is the tough part. The thing is that, uh, there are very, very few ways to actually hit this beast, because most of the time, what we were found finding when we did this before, was to do something like Epidemic, and you destroy all the Barges, great, but you still have, at that point, the beast might, for a split second, lose its immunity, but you've already played your card on that turn, so you can't do anything to hit the beast on that turn, and next go-round, respawns more beasts, and oh, you haven't actually made any progress. Then we started trying things like using the Rivian Sapper, which would chain together hitting Vargas after Vargas, and then one would have assumed that that would mean once you get rid of the last Vargas, because you can chain the death blow on these, that you'd be able to hit this beast at least once, drop it down to an 11 at that point, because once all of them are gone, it loses its immunity. No, not allowed to do that either. Odd, but okay, fine, be that way. In that case, that's not a solution. Then what about maybe using one of the Barges, which of course have lower power than the beast, to make this beast a little bit, uh, a little bit lower, to have it be a 4 rather than a 15, you do that, then suddenly you use an Epidemic, it's tied to the lowest unit, you destroy it. That may be possible because we did see that there are some instances in which the Barges would actually spawn on the other side of the beast as well, which is unusual, uh, normally units would only spawn to the right of things, but uh, the problem, once again, is that the beast has immunity, and so if you wanted to do that, you just can't target the beast with the, the alchemist, and so unless you destroy all the Vargas first, and in order to destroy all the Vargas first, you, uh, well, you would need to play a different card other than the alchemist, so that's not actually possible either unless, and this is the key, unless you play the Rivian Onager. This seems to be the only thing that can actually deal damage and destroy the Barges, and theoretically, on the same turn, once the immunity goes away on the beast, actually target this and deal damage to it. So I think the real answer is you need to stack up as many charges on this Onager as possible, and then, once you've done so, you subsequently remove all of the Barges remaining. That gets rid of the beast immunity, and at that point, because in order ability, you can still do, once you've played a card, you can still target the beast. So basically, it's all setting up the Rivian Onager for as many charges as possible. It starts with two charges, three damage per charge, uh, so that's six damage total, but we would need to have, in order to get 15 damage, three times five, we need five charges uh, to get to 15. So either we get five charges directly on the Onager, and if we can get rid of all the beasts, or rather get rid of all the Vargas, the beast loses its immunity, Onager can just go five straight order abilities straight at the beast and take it out. That might be possible, but at least with the uh, mental math that I've been doing, I'm not sure that we can quite make that work. I think what's more likely to happen is that we get this to have four charges, in which case we're dealing 12 damage, dropping him down to a three, at which point you may be tied for Rivian Onager, as the lowest unit on the board, so if we were to use an Epidemic as our last play, we would destroy the Onager, but if we destroy the Beast at the same time, all we need to do is destroy the Beast, so mission accomplished. I think that's the plan. How do we do that? We get charges on the Onager by destroying our own units. We tried doing this before. This was the thing that frustrated me the most last time, was we tried doing this before by playing Alchemists, or we might have, yeah, I think we played Alchemists, and then we used the Rivian Sapper rather than to target the Vargas, we went after our own units, destroyed the Alchemists, which should have given us additional charges on the Onager. However, that did not work 
in this case. So uh, that there's really no explanation for that. There's I, it, it's plainly written in the card, so that should be the case. But uh, so I, I don't have an answer for that. But uh, what we could do is if we can instead if we can instead find a different way to destroy our units and then get the onager to get more charges, then that could work. And I think the, that means the way we would need to destroy our units would be with Epidemic. Because, I mean, if we can't destroy our units with the Rivian Sapper and get charges, then Epidemic is the only other potential solution. So I think what we should do here is let's at least just test this a little bit. So we'll play the onager first. I still potentially think the solution that I'm theorizing here may ultimately still require that we chain together the death blows on the Rivian Sapper and have no choice but to destroy the Onager at the end of that. So if it does come to that, then we'll see if there's a, an alternative. But let's first see if this does work as I hoped it might. So I think what we start off with here is now we go Alchemist. So basically, in order to get the uh, the five to four charges on this thing, we have three units that we can destroy. We obviously can't destroy the Onager, otherwise we can't use the Onager's order abilities. So, starts with two, destroy this, we get three charges, destroy this, we get four charges, destroy this, we get five charges. So that would be ideal. That would be ideal, but I think what we might need to do is actually use a charge to set ourselves up here just a bit. Because the tricky thing is that Rivian Onager is currently the lowest unit on the board, and so if we don't do something to uh, weaken something else, then uh, that means any Epidemic is going to destroy this Onager before we can actually use it. And we just said Epidemic is the thing that we need to destroy our own units with, so uh, we need to lower these guys down to uh, be lower than the Onager. How do you do that? Well, simple, really. Greetings. Just waste its, it? its deployability. I think that's largely, largely just a, uh, a bit of a distraction. But we use one Oh, we can't use this on our own unit. I was going to say, okay, we damage the Alchemist, get it down to one power. Then we chain, uh, or actually, I think it was going to have to be Rivian Sapper first anyway. But, okay, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I'm still not sure this is going to work. But at least what I theorized, I think, may require that we go... Rivian Sapper first, because otherwise we will, I think, still find ourselves having to destroy our own unit, the Onager, at the end, which is obviously something that we cannot do. So here's the thing. We destroy all other bar guests. The beast loses its immunity. You would think that would mean you'd be able to hit the beast one more time with the Rivian Sapper. You cannot. There's no explanation for that. Um, that just feels like that is a uh, bad game design. And uh, But we'll see if we can still find a solution here, because... Now, oh, hold on, hold on. Okay, slightly different way of a uh, similar, similar solution. But what if we go Onager now, and hold on, the placement here does matter. We're going to bump up the Onager to an 8 by playing it next to the Sapper, and we're going to set a unit equal to the power of the units on its left. So this should be over here. Okay. Doesn't matter how many Bargets get spawned in, because we can destroy them all in one turn with Epidemic. So now we go Alchemist, and we use the Alchemist to get the Onager up to an 8. So now this will not get destroyed by an Epidemic. So that's the key here. Again, don't care about how many of these get spawned in. Now what we do is we'll play another Alchemist, and this one we just can't use on our own Alchemist, because we are going to try to destroy all these guys here. So what we do is just waste this deployability. I'm no mage. And we're still saving these, these charges. But now on our next turn, what we do is we're going to use an Epidemic, destroy all these bar guests, yes, in one fell swoop. True. We're also going to destroy these four power Alchemists because they're tied as the lowest powered units as well. And although we didn't get charges on the Onager when we destroyed our own units with the Sapper, I have to think that Epidemic does do that because otherwise there's zero way zero ways of getting the additional charges on the Onager, and that is something we need to do. Please give me charges. You did give me charges. Perfect. There was a delay, and I was really worried for a second there. But now, we can hit the beast, and we don't have enough to destroy it, but we can lower it down to a three, which means even after the Barkest gets spawned in, it will still be the lowest unit on the board, which means the Epidemic will still destroy the beast. 
There we go. Oh, thank goodness. That puzzle was going to haunt me in my dreams. But thankfully, we did find the answer. And uh, for what it's worth, in case you guys are wondering, uh, I, I'm not sure I was kind of on the fence after finishing the previous video as to whether I should put this, basically edit this to combine it with the previous video, or just do a subsequent video, separate video, either immediately afterward or maybe even wait an entire week. But this was recorded about five minutes after the, the original one, and I just walked away from the room for a second. I was like, wait, I think I have the answer. So it just felt like I needed a, a minute or two to compose my thoughts. And it does seem as though that was all we needed. We suspected that the treasure map that we saw recently, that we uncovered, was going to be right here. That was the thing that took us back over to this area at the end of the previous episode. But is it right here? Because I think it is. Let's double check. Or more so here. Okay, it's actually closer to the, the building itself right here. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Now we're in business. What is it? Oh, ho, 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 ho. what do we have here? That is a very big number. That is a very, very big number. Congratulations. You've discovered a car that can be used in quite multiplayer. Uh, well, that is Keltullus. That is the animated version of Keltullus. And as I think I stated when we encountered Keltullus earlier, I was at one point in time under the impression that Keltullus was the final boss of Thronebreaker, and at least this was well before I started playing Thronebreaker, when I just knew that, hey, Keltullus is a Thronebreaker card, I knew there was a really rare card, a really powerful card, and so I didn't know anything of the, well, technically the plotline is more that Meeve gets outcast, and so it's, it's more a question of her against Nilfgaard and not her against monsters, although obviously we do encounter monsters, so I still, for the longest time, thought that there was going to be some way in which Keltalus would find a way to be the final enemy of the game, but obviously that's not the case. So uh, I was under the impression that this was going to be the final card that we would unlock as well, but obviously that's not true either. But uh, so our, I don't remember. Does this mean that we also unlock a version of this card in Thronebreaker as well, or is it just the animated version for multiplayer as well? Either way, I think we'll definitely want to take another look here. The fact that we are not having our command tent light up suggests to me that we are not getting Keltalus in Thronebreaker, which does stink. I mean, great card in Gwent Multiplayer. Very, very unique in Gwent Multiplayer. Totally deck-defining. It's one that I like a lot. But uh, I, I was also excited to see that uh, 60 base power looked very nice as well. But alas, it seems as though not this time. At least not yet. Maybe on a later occasion, we might be able to get something like that in Thronebreaker as well, but uh, not today. Not today. Okay, well that was the puzzle over here that was causing us a bit of trouble, but it has been solved and we have found this golden chest as well, so perhaps it was fitting that we went and did this first so that we got the treasure map, so we could just immediately get the puzzle as soon as we, or immediately get the chest as soon as we went back over here. Other than that, are we still in low morale? I think we are. Yeah, which is unfortunate. Because as things currently stand, it does not appear that there's going to be anything else that we bump into before this main quest update here. And I imagine this is likely to be pretty big. So we probably want to be on decent morale for it. Then again, I mean, I feel like there have been times where it seemed as though the main quest encounters have been a little bit easier. Then some of the optional content, uh, maybe not 100% of the time, but maybe we can get away with the low morale now and save our shrines for a later occasion. I mean, I think this probably marks about the halfway point through Mockham. It's kind of hard to tell because it's very thin, winding roads. But we have zigged and zagged considerably here. We encountered Keltalus over in this area, of course. And then it's... At least through here, it, I mean, it's not exactly a straight shot. It's a little bit ziggy and zaggy still. But at least if we're talking about the percentage of the map that we have traversed thus far, it looks like it's about 50%. As for, you know, is it actually in the amount of map that we're capable of walking on and exploring, is that actually 50% that we've completed? That's a little bit harder to say, given how much of this is a impassable mountain. But uh, we're roughly halfway through, it does seem. So we might be starting to run low on time to make up to uh, make it up to Bruver 
as we did perhaps do several things that may have angered him. But I suppose we are on our way. Is there anything else we can do in preparation? We were just looking at our, our camp here, but in other upgrades, we do certainly have the resources to potentially make a pretty big upgrade of some variety or two. But I think we've established that that is something we'd like to do on more of an as-needed basis. And, of course, we don't really know if we need that stuff just yet. Just hoping we are just about to pick up a really big card in the form of Keltellus that might significantly contribute toward our future efforts. But alas, that is not the case. I don't think Recruit Cap matters too much at this point. Though those have been the types of upgrades we've been focusing on thus far. Otherwise, we're looking at unlocking new cards or powering up existing cards to be a little bit stronger. Yeah. Okay, I think we proceed here. I think we give this a shot, and I'm not really sure what we're expecting here. We're just going to Boros Rump for the summit meeting. I mean, is this really? Hold on. Is this where the summit is happening? Because I assumed that the summit was going to be happening here. I assumed that this was just like some kind of, like, is this the summit with Bruber? Because I thought this was just going to be, you know, a little in-between type of thing. Because uh, if this is the the moment of judgment with Bruver, then we may not have had time to redeem ourselves all that much. Which does make me a bit nervous. Does make me a bit nervous. I was still thinking we might have had a little more time as we were going through a village or two before we made our way all the way to the very end for us to do a, you know, one or two things that might have made Bruber a little bit happier with us, but yeah, I'm afraid that may not actually be possible anymore. Also, just curious to see if there's anything hiding over here. No, we, we checked that spot. We've been there. But yeah, I think we might just need to uh, accept our actions and live with the consequences at this point. So I'm not sure there's much much in the way of workarounds anymore. We shan't pass this way. Oh, rain it. Whatever would we do without you? Plum <laughs> it off the cliff like lemmings, no doubt. Oh, Raynard. I mean I'm still curious to see if there's like Hidden treasure here. Also, can we walk off the edge? That is disturbing how close we get. Like, Meeve is basically walking off the edge. There's a little bit of loot down here, actually, it seems. Actually, somewhat significant at that. Hmm. Looks like a collapsed cart of some variety. Can we squeeze in through here as well? Hiding anything in there? This narrow alcove? No, it doesn't seem like it. Okay. In which case, I think we're headed straight over there. I don't think we can stall much more, because that is the spot. And as I said, I am uh, a little nervous, because I feel like the number of things we did to anger Bruver might be more than the number of things that we did to please Bruver, and that may not bode well for us here. Meave squinted and gazed off into the distance. It seemed to her that hundreds of black patches covered the peaks on the horizon. Once she had uh -oh. up closer, she realized these were the windows of homes carved out of solid rock. Her pride this was, sighed Gabor. Burrows Rump. A city carved out of mountain rock. Hundreds of miles of tunnels, dozens of steelworks, smithies and forges. Now, it's a vast lair to monsters. Oh. The ewes from underground weave their nests, hatch their young, and when hunger hits them in the gut, Prowl down into the pass. Okay, at first I thought when it said, how did they phrase it? The black patches. I thought that they were either Nilfgaardian flags, because those are mostly black, or like just Nilfgaardian symbols carved into the stone. So I was like, oh no. Does this mean that this is our these are the consequences that we were just anticipating we might run into that by not doing as Bruver pleased. It's not just that he's not going to offer us support or anything like that. It's just that the entirety of Mahakam has sided with Nilfgaard instead of siding with us. Forget about neutrality. They picked their side. 
doesn't seem as though that's the case, and in fact, if Bruber is not here, and if, if instead we are fighting off monsters, then maybe that is a chance for us to continue to uh, get back on Bruber's good side. Neve stood at the entrance to the underground city. The monumental gate, cast in bronze, lay on the ground, folded multiple times as a scroll of paper. Out of blackened windows oozed a stench of rotting meat and mold. The queen bent an ear to hear water dripping, and, in the distance, a metallic scraping. A sound akin to chitinous scales rubbing against rock. The soldiers Two riders were approaching? Race, said Reynard quietly, as if he feared he would wake the beasts asleep in the caverns. Yeah. Do you recall my words as we fled Lyria? Said Meave, turning to Reynard. You swore you would retake your crown. Even if you had to penetrate hell to do so. Time to follow that oath. The queen inhaled deeply Ooh. and stepped forward. Her sword I recognize that. prepared to strike or parry. Moments later, it was swinging, fighting, as the current tenants of Boros Rump came out to meet her. That's a Shalemar. All right, and that is the Gwent card for a Shalemar. Let's see. Once upon a time, the... I'm not going to try to pronounce this. The clan mined Boros Rump for iron ore. When the Rump's last veiny deposit was extracted, the dwarves, with their hallmark pragmatism, repurposed the spent shafts into living quarters. Little did they know that their innovative housing project would soon shelter an unanticipated class of tenants. Optional, destroy the monster nest. Okay, so is the necessary thing is just to outscore our opponents? But if we destroy the monster nest, then we automatically win? Or is there some other objective that is not blatantly obvious that we don't know about here yet? Like, hey, by the way, Meeve is going to be a card on the board, and if she gets destroyed, then you lose? Something like that, so Meeve just has to survive? I don't know! But it's a story battle. We will have special rules, and it is just one round. Okay, so let's see what this is all about. I'm excited. Okay. And the music is great. I love it. Okay, before we start choosing our cards, remember we are on low morale here. So we can bump it back up if we need to. If we, I mean, we can basically restart this encounter and, uh, well, retreat to a Shrine because we do have several that we've not yet used. But let's see what the deal is. The Shalemar, it's a burly Shalemar. Every turn on turn start, destroy the lowest ally and boost a random ally by its power. Okay, so it's basically built in consumption, if you will, every turn. And the problem is that, yes. It's going to be a bunch of Death Wish units, cards that they do want to destroy. Ah, the music is so good! They've got the Lele Lays! It reminds me of the Hearts of Stone boss fight theme for a, a certain someone, a little bit. You might know who I'm referring to. But, uh, okay, so. These are going to get destroyed if we don't destroy them ourselves. But the Slizzard Nest, I assume this is the monster nest in question. It is a boss. Every three turns of turn start, spawn a slizzard. Damage self by 10 whenever a slizzard is destroyed. Oh. Okay. We've seen slizzards before. They will damage us. But we do have the means. Another means to deal damage to the slizzard nest beyond just attacking it directly. So, let's see. Who has restraints? We can move you with a Stray Slinger if we'd like. We can target you with a Cavalry. I think that's going to be an awfully long time before we deal 75 damage with the Cavalry, so that might not be the answer we're looking for. Gascon does not give us damage. So if we are trying to go all in on destroying this thing, then he is probably not someone that we're looking for here. Similar with Reynard. Slinger is some damage, at least. Skull is... It is damage, yes. But it's hard to say in a short battle like this how much damage we're actually going to be able to get from it. Alzer's Thunder is definitely the key. In fact, Alzer's Thunder on a Slizzard that is right next to the Slizzard Nest would be amazing. You deal the 10 damage to the Nest and then the 5 damage to the Slizzard, destroying that. And uh, in doing so, dealing additional 10 damage to the Slizzard Nest as well. That'd be just totally awesome. In fact, Technically speaking, if we are really clever, we might be able to use 
Where'd you go? The slingers? To set it up so that there is a slizzard on each side of the slizzard nest, so that we then use the Alistair Thunder, destroy the slizzard nest, destroy two of the slizzards with the five damage to adjacent units, and then we get an extra ten damage by destroying two slizzards there. So that is really tempting. I think we've learned a fair bit here about what we want to go for. And that is that, well, primarily that we, we don't really want you. So can we outscore our opponent? Is that sufficient? No, we, we never want Nickers in hand because he gets summoned out anyway. Okay, we might want a lot of Slingers if we are trying to set up the Alistair's Thunder. I mean, even then, it, even without this, it's still a, a source of damage, which is probably what we're trying to go for. Isbel with the healing... Technically, she starts off with a two power boost because these guys have been damaged. We can use all of our our redraws here, our mulligans, because this is only a one round match. So, Isabel, if we are trying to outscore them, not damage the scissor nest, then she could be a solid choice. But if we're trying to do damage, then she obviously doesn't have damage. So, I think we do dump her. And just all the slingers in the world for more damage. And uh, not sure the cavalry makes that that much sense for us? Although we might not have much of an option. I'd like to make it known that us gnomes don't run so fast. You know, in case you were planning to skip out on the quick. <laughs> okay, so we do have a leader ability. I think we'd like to not use that on the Harpy Eggs. We might want to... Oh, I'd actually love if this were going to trigger immediately. We actually want this thing to spawn in the scissors. That gives us solid targets for our damage and our leader ability. And if we wait to use our leader ability until there are a bunch of scissors out, then we might be able to destroy them all because they only have five power apiece. So, like three scissors on the board, move them all with a stray slinger, drop them all down to three, then they're in removal range for our leader ability. Destroy them all. That's 30 damage to the scissor nest, and that is sizable. That is a sizable chunk. So I think we actually we would have preferred, certainly if we knew that we were going to get Savior wherever you ended up, we would have preferred to have gotten uh, Stray's Cavalry, because that could have been a decent first turn play for us. But in the absence of that, we might be looking at a bomber. There's a chance if we use the bomber in this range here that it might destroy an occasional Harpy, or Harpy Egg rather, and in doing so spawn in harpies but i think we're gonna have to live with that because if we're trying to deal damage to you then we don't really care about if they outscore us and so additional harpies getting spawned in is not actually a huge deal more so just the sector storms might be permanently bricked by the harpy eggs and we maybe should have anticipated this because we have seen this happen to us a lot as of late but let us begin with the bomber watch your heads <laughs> And given how there is going to be a bit of a delay before the Slizzard starts spawning in, I think we do still go for our, our leader ability here. It is, it's likely that we're going to see the Arvalis destroy at least one of these Harpy Eggs. And again, I think we're just going to have to live with that. Okay. Ah, damn it! They're hatching! Place is about to swarm with creepers! Yeah, but I think it's a bit of a distraction from the primary purpose, which is to target you. And if anything, I actually might have preferred if the other Arbalist had hit you as well. Ah, well, no, then it would have just gone for the Harpy with this Scepter Storms rather than the Scissor Nest. So, yeah, th this is going to be really hard to make this work at all. But I think we still pass here. Oh, wait. I forgot about this, though. I did forget about this, though. Boost a random ally by its power. Okay, so at least, I think in this case, yeah, it boosted this Harpy. So in some ways, we actually want there to be a lot of units on the board. Because then there's a lower probability that the lowest unit powers up the Scissor Nest. I mean, if it's going to always be Harpy Eggs, then I don't think that's a huge concern. If this happens to get two more power, that's probably not going to be a difference maker. They did play a Scissor, and I assume... Okay, now this is a dangerous assumption. Does this get damaged by 10 only when we destroy the five power slizzards that it spawns in directly? Or 
Does it also get damaged by 10 when we destroy the other Slizzards that are 8 power and 2 armor that they are playing from their starting deck? I would think that this would count too. That this would also deal damage to them if we were to destroy this Slizzard. But as I said, I think that is a dangerous assumption and I have been hurt by those dangerous assumptions in the past. So I'm not sure if we can rely on that. I think, I think we may still be biding some time here, waiting for the other scissors to spawn in before we go for the Alzer's Thunder. So we might set this row on fire as well and just accept that, again, we're quite possibly going to trigger these Harpy Eggs and that's just a sad truth, but actually might not be that bad. Might actually help us in some ways because it has a chance of making it so that uh, this no longer will boost up the scissored nest. It might boost up someone else, because the more units there are, the lower probability that this is the specific one that gets the boost. Except it was on that occasion. And it was a, what, like, one in six chance, so... Unlucky there. But this is why we actually kind of like for more of the harpies to spawn in. But we don't want the harpies next to you, is the thing that we don't really want. You're down to six. So you're almost in removal range for what it's worth. And they did do, what, a little bit of damage with the Slizzard, right? It will deal a fair bit of damage the longer it takes us to get rid of it, so that is also worth considering. But the more units we lose, the more powerful Skull becomes. So that's actually also not a terrible thing. So, hmm. Again, I'm kind of trying to wait for them to get the, the other Slizzards out here before we start using things like Alzer's Thunder or Stray Slingers to set up the Alzer's Thunder by moving these guys out of the way and making sure that the Slizzards are next to this. I mean, we actually could... Hmm. We could move one, two, and three with one of the Slingers, and then we'd be guaranteed to get at least get one Slizzard next to you, because usually... When you spawn a unit, that unit gets spawned directly to the right of whatever it is that's spawning it, or the rightmost spot of a row. And so that would possibly mean that this lizard that this spawns in is going to end up next to it anyway, but this might be a way to guarantee that, in case that assumption is not correct. So maybe we do go that route. Ever have a storm knock out one of your teeth? That was a lot of damage from that fire. And there are the scissors. Okay. Okay. So, as we said, Scepter Storms is uh, pretty much just a pure brick here. But, and once again, we unfortunately, I'm not sure if I believe this, that it's a random unit. That is a very, very low problem. Honestly, I mean, what it, there's like one in five or one in six chance of it happening the first time, which is either a 20% chance or a 16.6 .6 repeating percent chance. And then for it to happen again when there are even more units on the board on the next turn was, what well, I mean, how many units were there? Like maybe eight? In which case that was a 12.5% chance. So those two things happening one right after the other is just above a 1% chance of happening. So for that to be coincidence feels like that's, uh, well, it's unlikely, right? Feels like maybe this is just going to always boost the Slizzard Nest, even if it doesn't say that that's the case. But at this point, at this point, uh, hmm. I was trying to set up a big Slinger, or rather a big Alzer's Thunder play here, which... Ideally, that means Slizzard on either side of this Slizzard Nest may still be possible. So it did spawn right next to it, as we had kind of hoped it would, although we hedged our bets here and made sure they at least got one. So what we could do is if we move one Slizzard and then move the Slizzard Nest, and then on our next turn we move the other Slizzard down, then we can go with the, uh, the Super Slizzard Destruction. So that might be the, the play here. So it should be... 
should be you first. So that you'll be on the left side of the scissor nest, then on our next turn, scissor nest plus this other scissor. That means we are looking for other stuff to move. And it should be things in this row, moving up to this row, otherwise they're gonna mess with our formula here, our recipe for success. I mean, technically, hold on. Technically, we should try. We should try to get rid of these weak units if we can. Because it might make it more feasible for Scepter of Storms to work. Because right now would be... Yeah, we're still looking at, what? There's four charges. One, two, three, four. Still mostly a brick. Okay, yeah, that's fine, actually. That's not fine. We don't like that. That we don't like. I, stop spawning them where... What the... Okay, maybe... Maybe we're trying to be a little too clever here. <laughs> maybe we're trying to be a little too clever here. And uh, it will not be quite as easy to put all the scissors next to the scissor nest as I had hoped it might be. Because uh, they will continue to spawn in these harpies and harpy eggs, which I admittedly kind of forgot was going to disrupt this combo. So, yeah. In that case, I guess we're just looking to... Mm. Can we still make it work, though? <laughs> Can we still make it work, though? Uh... Mm. Maybe not. So now I'm having to ask myself, do we try to use the Slinger to destroy the two power cards, namely mostly the Harpies, so we don't trigger the death blows if we can avoid it, so that it becomes easier for Scepter Storms to do something useful? Or do we just say, nah, play it simple here, just target the units that you want to deal damage to? This is capable of getting destroyed from our leader ability. If we were to go the four our route, which is not a terrible idea. There is also the option to go in the five power route, but hmm. maybe we get the best of both worlds and weaken you a bit. Because then the other ones are also going to start in at five power as well. Is the thing. Yeah. To so tell you what, I think we might need Alistair's Thunder now. So I think chances are we should we should bet on the Slizzard being in five power for the durability setup. Rather than four. Okay. It will damage us when the Slizzards get destroyed. But it means we now have one unit in our graveyard, which means Skull can at most deal one damage, but that should improve as time goes on here. And we will have our leader ability on the next turn. No, we actually don't want you to get it, though. Except you get up to a five, which once this spawns in another scissor, is actually not a terrible thing. Oh, no, it's one more turn. Eee, okay. Um, well... In that case... It is a little bit awkward here. Trying to line up the numbers. Yeah, I think we've been across the board, perhaps being too clever. Trying to get all the scissors on the same amount of power, which is hard to do when the rows are on fire and they're, some of them are getting damaged from fire, some of them are getting boosted from this leader ability, some of them are uh, are getting played for eight power, whereas other ones are getting spawned for five power. So lining up all the scissors has been a bit of a challenge, but fire is what? two damage. So it's never gonna get you on the same amount of power as this guy. That much is impossible. Hmm. Hmm. Tough. Tough. I think we're just, we're just taking damage then. Just dealing damage, that is. And... This row is full. We actually can't move things over here. And I kind of want to keep you on five power. Because that also stinks. 
Huh. Gross. Gross. <laughs> uh, I mean, if we if we do lower you down to three, it's possible we might be able to make you the lowest unit. But it is going to require probably that we destroy some of these guys. Spawn in bigger harpies. I don't love it. I definitely don't love it. But now, Scepter of Storms hits you, you, and you. So that's one, two, three charges. Then that's three charges remaining, which would go toward you. It's actually overkill for you. We were to hold on. We were to go leader ability on you. That drops you down to a three. Wait a second. Oh, no, four, rather. Uh, that, for what it's worth, does make Scepter Storms immediately go for this lizard. One charge... Two, three, four. And that's random. Which four power units are going to go after after that? But with a slinger, we can guarantee that it hits this. So I think we wait on this. And that is another scissor going down here from the fire. Uh, what? Oh, okay. So now the problem is that they have no more space to spawn in the scissors. In fact, okay, they did. They did at least spawn this one in. I was concerned that we didn't get this one. But, uh, ooh. Also, the movement or lack thereof will be an issue. I think this is definitely the time for Skull to just clear out this row. And wait, how many units do we have? One, two, three, four almost enough to destroy you. Almost. But then I suppose we can follow up with Scepter of Storms and take you out that way. And that's... 20 damage to this Slizzard Nest from the Slizzards alone getting destroyed. Then it'll be a little bit of damage directly from Skull. Hmm. It's gonna be close. I don't know if we have quite enough to get this job done here. We're gonna see. I think it does have to be Skull here, otherwise... Movement is impossible, I and mean, we could use Xavier as a throwaway, but I'm not sure that really benefits us at all. I mean, he was never going benefit to us, benefit us at any point in time, really. But is there any reason why waiting a turn for these guys to do the thing would be helpful? Oh, well. Well, actually, yes. Actually, yes. Because giving them more time to deal damage to us, because they do that every turn, does mean likely that we get more cards in our graveyard... And that means that Skull is stronger. And I think that is worth doing. We also have no idea what Bone Talisman is going to do. But I think we actually do deliberately use Xavier here. Just to bide some time. There is always a chance of fire doing stuff as well. We lose some units. That's what we wanted, honestly. So that we get a little bit stronger. Oh, the Rot Fiend's in the same row. As the Slither Nest would be great. That is the Slither getting destroyed by the fire. That is convenient. We didn't really expect that to happen, but uh, that does work. You're down to 27. Ooh. Ooh, and I think we will have enough time for one more Slither to spawn in. Which is a good thing. Ooh, and also... And also... Hold on just a second. What if we stray Slinger to move some Rot Fiends over here. And if those get destroyed by a skull, then suddenly we have, uh, our, our job gets a whole lot easier. I think that is definitely the plan. And then, kinda like to keep Slizzard in there still. Just get you out of there, especially because you're a two and we don't like twos. We want our low powered units to be the ones we actually want to destroy with Scepter Storms, come to think of it. Me one charge on you. One, two, three, four, and then a bunch of things tied at, at four after that. I can't really guarantee that we're getting much out of that, so I think we do still wait until post skull in all likelihood. And at this point, we have one, two, three, four, five, six units 
in our graveyard for six damage to everything in this row, which means when they spawn in this last Slizzard, if we save Skull for the very end, then that could destroy any remaining Slizzard and in doing so also like to destroy this Slizzard Nest uh, or Rot Fiends and in doing so, this Slizzard Nest. So I like the looks of that a lot. Always the fire damage as well. Would help us too. Did this scissor get boosted up from the leader ability? It might have. Don't remember what the deal is with you. I think that's fine. I think that's still fine. We don't like you hanging out there though. We we don't like that. Because we would very much like for you to have room to spawn in this last lizard. And you can't really do that if the row is full. So I think what that means is we're probably still doing Bone Talisman here and saving Skull for the very end. But if the random thing that Bone Talisman does does not clear out at least some space in this row, then we will likely use Scepter of Storms to at least get rid of some of these guys. This will spawn in another Harpy, but this will get destroyed and, and permanently go away, as will this, and this will actually deal a whole bunch of damage to other units, and uh, that will destroy this Lizard. And so that... That could help us a whole lot. So what the heck is Bone Talisman going to do for us, though? Uh, yeah, we've seen this before. It redistributes points, seemingly. Or, like, destroys our weakest unit and heals our other units. So that really doesn't help us at all. So, uh, yeah, we're going to set for Storms. Lots of charges there. It does destroy... A lot of stuff, including one of the scissors, and it destroyed a Rot Fiend as well, which is where it damaged all the other units in that row. Oh, we're not gonna have a leader ability, but we will have a, a skull with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight units minimum in our graveyard. Not quite enough damage to destroy this lizard directly, but it would be enough to destroy this Rot Fiend and. The Slizzard that they will presumably spawn into this row as well, which should be enough to get the job done. It's also potentially the fire. Oh, don't boost this up with your leader ability. That's no good. Okay, destroy that. Destroy that. Do it. Do it. It makes bone. It makes a uh, skull stronger. Destroy that too. Uh, did you spawn the Slizzard? Because it kind of looks like you didn't. You spawned it there. Oh. Wait, what? That's a first. Oh. Okay, that... That actually significantly complicates things. That's actually huge. If this lizard was in this row, we would win guaranteed. Hold on, how many units are now in the graveyard? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I think this still works. If we go... Range rail. Nine damage is not enough to destroy this lizard, but it is enough to destroy this Rot Fiend, which will damage all their units in this row by three, which is just barely enough to destroy this lizard nest. But uh, I was originally thinking this was going to end up in this row. We damage this lizard nest and destroy this lizard in the process, so we'd get, uh, you know, that nine or whatever damage. Yeah, I think we said nine from the the skull. And then the additional 10 from this, which would be more than enough. But, uh, okay, it was perhaps a little closer than I had anticipated, but I think we do have just enough here. Because that rot fiend goes down, it has the extra damage, and that destroys the scissor nest. Follow me! And there we go. Mission accomplished. Very cool. The wounded. Neve approached the Sheomar, which lay writhing on the ground. She then ran her sword through its heart, finishing it. Yet so spent was she that she lacked the strength to pull her blade from between the plates of the chitinous armor. Neve? She whispered. It was very close. Neve? But we get a new card, Wolfsbane. I feel like we might have seen this once with, uh... One of our other cards that can give us access to a trinket, but let's see. This card's been added to our, our army and can be found in the command tent. The we can definitely claim it. The a vast hall that had once served the clans as their meeting room. 
The stone benches were covered in sticky slime and insectoid eggs, while mm. plants of varying size hung from the crystal chandeliers. Gascon rummaged through old, weathered bones, surely hoping to find something of value. Gabor, in turn, was at a shut and locked door, grappling with it as if it were a deadly beast. The door finally gave way with a sigh, and the dwarf raised his arms in a triumphant gesture. Oh? It's a storeroom. Should hold miners tools aplenty, he said, infused. Some barrels of alchemical brews in here, too. Lucky there's no sign of moisture. They haven't they soaked through. All's we've got to do is roll them out into the corridor and set a bit of fire to them. And woof! We'll have sealed the beasts off from the pass once and for all. Meave treated the dwarves' instructions as hallowed. Soon after, the mountains trembled from a powerful explosion. Rubble came down and blocked the tunnels. They say the plumes of smoke escaping the window openings in the rock could be seen as far as Aldersburg. I mean, it is where we came from. I, initially, I, at first, I thought that maybe, given how that at one point in time this was a place that was used by the dwarves, that we might be able to, you know, just clean things up a little bit and, and say, hey, Brewer, look at this. It's all nice and fine and dandy. You can go back over here and start using it once again. Now you're happy, right? But, uh, I, or we could just, you know, completely destroy the place because it's overrun with monsters and apparently there's no hope for ever having it cleaned up and usable again. That works too, I suppose. Didn't really have a choice in the matter, though. Whoa! Yup, uh, that, that is a lot of fire. That is a lot of fire. Let us loot a bit here. It's a decent amount of coinage. Decent amount of coinage there as well. Oh, there's... A whole bunch of these piles so that's good news so i don't know if that's something that Bruver would approve of again it's uh it's a story mission so it's of course required and it's not something that we had a choice in i don't know if there's anything that we did earlier that might have potentially given us a choice if we had approached it differently but uh well we have successfully taken down the shale mar and we do have some updates here let's take a look we completed this map, yes, but we have a new report, perhaps, on the singed parchment. Document found at Boros Rump. Gates barricaded. Those blasted arse wipes from... Fire outside the window. Monsters everywhere. No way out. If anyone reads this, the Elder in Chief, he's gotta be told. Okay. Okay. That sounds like that could be useful information to have. Have to inform Bruver that uh, got something got set on fire. I mean, before we did all this stuff, before we exploded this place, something got set on fire and sabotaged, it seemed. Seemed like there was some third party, some other entity that did that, but it got cut off before we could see what that was. And, of course, I'd imagine that that might be Nilfgaard. But there's also that new card that we picked up. So let's take a look at what we just got here. I think it was Wolfsbane. Draw two units and set their power to one? Huh. Now that's an interesting one. Now that is an interesting one. Because on one hand, drawing two units means you... Out of one card, you get two other cards. So that's useful. On the other hand... Setting their power to one, depending on what card that is, might mean we're significantly reducing the value of that card. If it's something like Isbel, starting off at three power, as long as she stays on the board long enough to use her order ability, then that might not be a huge deal, it's just minus two points on her, so to get her in her hand when we otherwise wouldn't have her, that sounds pretty decent. But on the other hand, if it were, say... Where'd you go? If it were Gascon... Maybe he was hanging out in our deck, but he got empowered from all the movement that we had done previously. He would have been something like a 12, uh, a 15, a 20, you know, sometimes he gets up in that range. And for him to get dropped down to one after that would significantly reduce his value to the point where he's quite literally just a one point unit that, I mean, technically may still be able to get a little bit higher than that if we then do subsequent movement after that, but... It's, uh, maybe that means you go Wolfsbane at the very beginning of a match? 
That's a little risky, though, because it's a very slow-paced play where oftentimes at the beginning of a match, you want to do things like damage people with Alzer's Thunder to get rid of their most threatening cards. And if you're doing this first, then you're giving those cards more time to set up. So, I don't know how I feel about this. It's a weird one. It's a very weird one. So I'm reluctant to throw it in. Then again, we do have Bone Talisman right now that we've now, I think, started to get a much better sense as to what that's about, and I have not been terribly impressed. So, if we're looking for something to replace that, then maybe it could be Wolfsbane, or maybe there's something else that I've forgotten about that we've been holding on to. Like, Mandrake we got via Barnabas, I think, on a somewhat recent occasion, and that could, could be, I mean, that's basically, actually, it's a decent comparison between these two. Basically, draw two units, which you will eventually play, except in this case, they're on one power, versus you're immediately playing two units. They're bronze in the case of Mandrake, whereas this could be gold units, so these are going to be theoretically weaker. These are potentially, uh, potentially, a little bit stronger, but because you're bumping them down to one power, you might be significantly reducing the value of them, whereas in this case, you're getting them in their usual form. Because you're drawing these, not playing them straight away, that means you have a little bit of time to plan when and how best to use those cards that you acquire, whereas in this case, they're random and you play them immediately, so there's no way to make sure that you're setting them up properly. So there's a little bit of risk coming from that. And also, these are both cards from your own deck, so presumably they work with what you're trying to do with your deck, whereas in this case, you're getting one from your deck, but one from your opponent's deck, and your opponent's deck might totally contrast with like, what you're trying to do on your side of the board. So uh, it's it's still, I mean, if we're looking at, like, honestly, I don't think it takes much to top Bone Talisman. So given, given what we've seen thus far, I think we probably do swap it out for something else. Is it Mandrake? Is it something else that we have here that is better still? Martyr and Bear, in terms of just pure points, can be very effective. But it is situational, because it does, ideally, have mean that we have a, a one or two power damage unit that we can swap into a bear, and therefore we're getting basically just 20 points out of this. But if we don't really have any damage units at all, then it just doesn't work. Or if we have a damage unit, but it's a high power damage unit, then it's uh, significantly less valuable. I did not remember this. I remember that we... I remember that we acquired this card, because I remember that I had seen the art for what in Gwent Multiplayer is Spores, but uh, I did not remember the effect of this card. So that could potentially be quite solid. Then again, it maybe contrasts a little bit with Skull, because we are trying to accumulate units in our graveyard, and then banish them with Skull to get as much damage as possible. If we're playing them out for our graveyard, then that makes that a little bit trickier. Hmm. Never yet used Dimeridium Bomb, I don't think, but there are circumstances, kind of like some of the encounters we've done recently, where units are, opposing units are consuming other units and significantly increasing their power. That could be helpful. I mean, Alistair's Thunder has just been amazing for us. If we get something else along those lines, like Dazbog Runestone is kind of close. It's just way less damage, but it's the same general idea. Echo Stark Mirror would have been helpful, in that encounter as well for 15 damage on the nest but it is also hard to manage this because sometimes you get the 15 damage on your opponent sometimes you don't sometimes you boost yourself by 15 sometimes you don't if this didn't have restraint it would be so good i'm not sure we have much in the blitz units anymore Raynard is Stray's Bomber is. That's actually... Okay, hold on. Stray's Cavalry is. I think when we first got... Wherever it was, you. We didn't have much in the way of Blitz units, so it just felt like this was pretty useless, but we have at least some. So it's also another uh, trinket that plays two units from our deck. We have some control over this one. Wait, move it to our hand? 
I saw the... Well, I don't remember looking at this at all, to be honest with you. Transforming them into a jade figurine. Don't really know what that is, statistically speaking. But move it into our hands, so we are quite literally capturing one of our opponent's cards. Very fitting for The Witcher 2. But uh, Restraint, of course. Obviously, if you could do that on a boss, it'd be unbelievably powerful. I think we'll keep it as is for now with Mandrake. There are some other similar cards there are, that do things like Royal Decree, where we're also playing units, as we discussed, and things that are similar to Alistair's Thunder, like Dawsbog Runestone, and perhaps to a lesser extent, Becker's Dark Mirror. But oh, I think we'll stick with things like this for now. But with that, we have completed what was the... Technically, might only be the second main quest encounter here in Mahakam, so I'm curious to see where the next one is. It might be at the very end. No, it's over here in this dramatic-looking place. I assume that's some kind of mine. But uh, I was also concerned that we might have been confronting Bruver here, and uh, that we might not have had much time to win him back over. But now that we have completed this encounter, have not encountered Bruver, we may still have additional opportunities to get back on his good side before we see him again. So that gives me a little more hope. And with that, I think this is a good place for us to wrap up here. So thank you all for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video. And I'll catch you next time.